Hello, I'm Tina Kayser with the Natural Medicine Journal, and I'm talking today with Dr. Peter Diadamo, the originator of the blood type diet. We're going to talk about blood type, coronavirus, foods, and infections. I'm hoping to get some clarification on the conflicting information, whether or not blood type may affect the risk or the severity of COVID. Dr. Diadamo is Distinguished Professor of Clinical Sciences at the University of Bridgeport. He's the former creator and director of the Center of Excellence on Generative Medicine at the University of Bridgeport. He's CEO of Datapunk, a bioinformatics software developer, and he's author of the New York Times bestseller, Eat Right for Your Type. He's also 1990 AANP Physician of the Year. Dr. Diadamo, thank you so much for taking the time to join me today. My pleasure, Tina. Thank you for having me. So just to put a foundation to our audience, some people know about the blood type diet, some people don't know about the blood type diet. Um, I know this is kind of your life's work, so I'd like you to start at the beginning and just give a little short primer um, on the blood type diet and how, what it's based on, and, and then we can launch right into how it is involved with the current um, COVID crisis. Yeah, we, we sort of got caught up in COVID uh, by virtue of a lifelong interest that I've got <clears throat> to, uh, I guess you could just say non-transfusion significance of ABO blood types. So in other words, it's anything about blood type expression or significance that doesn't have to do with transfusion medicine. And in particular, we're talking about a ABO system. So that would be, the, of course, the, the 800-pound gorilla because that's the system that does kill you if you wind up with the wrong transfusion. And uh, the, the work was actually an intergenerational work. My, my father, also a naturopath, James, had asked a very, very basic question early on in his career, which was, uh, I mean, it's still being, we're still trying to answer this question 50 years later, which is why do some people do better on this diet and some people do better on that diet? And uh, there was no nutrigenomic field. There wasn't even a word for it back then, but he thought that he could, uh, he had heard of some work that had been done, I believe, in Norway or in Germany that looked at ABO as a predictor of uh, diet. And, and he found this was a reliable thing that he could do that could kind of partition his, his patient base. And so he just proceeded to blood type people and kind of empirically looked at things and came to a couple of great kind of simple kind of you go this way, you go that way kind of conclusions. Uh, type A and O, which are by far the... 85% of the population, more or less, and some populations even more. Uh, well, with type O, we, you know, he felt we're, we're basically a kind of a more of a high protein type diet, and type A, he felt was more of a plant-based diet. So you have a kind of a bifurcation there that could encapsulate 85% of the population right there with a simple binary thing. So you go that way, you go that way. Um, and then, you know, we sort of collected data and he kept working on this. And I went to Bastyr and had to produce a, a journal club uh, report uh, for Joe Pizzorno and decided to pick this topic. Um, frankly, it, having gone through Bastyr, I was in my fourth year, I, I didn't think this idea had much of a grounding because there was nothing in my education that said that there ought to be any relationship between blood groups and diet. I mean, this was just something that was on your erythrocytes, but red blood cells. So I went to university, I figured, let me subject it to a literature search and see what the story was. And uh, very pleasantly, or, well, very pleasantly surprised, of course, you know, who wants to not be able to tell your dad, hey, you're not as crazy as I thought you were. Um, but, you know, the reality was, is that there was a considerable amount of observational studies over the years uh, with regard to things like physiological changes and disease susceptibility. So there had been a, a lot of work that had categorized, indeed, Actually, entire textbooks have been done on, on disease associations with ABO blood type. Uh, and uh, there's long, strong associations with uh, certain uh, oncological situations, certain cancers, cardiovascular disease, metabolic illnesses. Um, some of them strong, some weak. The, the stronger ones had a lot to do with digestive secretions, which I thought was kind of interesting. You know, there was very strong studies that had shown uh, uh, peptic ulcer and duodenal ulcer associations with type O and atrophic gastritis and stomach cancer with type A. So we had a hyperchlorohydria or achlorohydria kind of a variation there. Um, and then also too, physiologically, there were significant differences in a lot of enzymes that were part of the fundamental breakdown of, of macro molecules, uh, including uh, brush border hydroxylases and uh, 
uh, the intestinal phosphatases, which have huge variations by the blood types. And these enzymes basically break down fat and cause, cause us to uh, do a better job of assimilating minerals. And, and, and these enzymes vary by 2.5 to 3-fold, just be in normal subjects based upon blood group. So there was uh, a lot of uh, good fundamental data that showed that there was conditioning that was taking place in the digestive tract with regard to secretions that painted a somewhat consistent picture that certain people were better off or maybe more adapted to a certain type of food than others. Then about that time, I started becoming very interested in the uh, work that was being done with what are called plant lectins. And these are uh, proteins that interact with uh, sugar molecules uh, in, in very, very specific ways. Uh, and many of these lectins are found in, in consumable foods. So for instance, uh, beans, uh, seeds, uh, legumes, uh, many grains have these naturally occurring proteins that are, um, they're naturally occurring what are called agglutinins. They, they cause things to get stuck together. Or sometimes they just glom onto cells and reprogram and do crazy things. But the reality was that these lectins, quite a few of them showed blood type specificity because blood type actually is a gene, but the physical manifestation of blood type is the appearance of certain sugars on the cells of your body. And of course, this is what drives the transfusion associations, uh, but also too, those very same sugars line the digestive tract and they're found in body secretions, vaginal secretions, uh, seminal distress, all over the place. And so the idea that there was a conditioning aspect to the digestive tract with regard to a carbohydrate expression that could be predicted by a very simple and easy to achieve genetic outcome. Right? And you can, you can blood type yourself you know, for next to nothing or go buy a home typing test and, or go give some blood. You know? Uh, and so that really was another stronger case and that these uh, phosphatases were uh, very significantly in favor of type O. So then we looked at the uh, lectins that were showing specificity and that sort of rounded out the picture. So we had physiological, secretory, um, and then actual uh, molecular lock and key relationships that could be predicted with foods and blood types. And, and lectins are actually a very funny class of molecules. It, the name means I choose in Latin. It comes from the Latin word for, for, for lock, the lock and key relationship. Uh, and they're typically found in most of our foods because they function in that embryonic tissue as a primitive immune system. So in other words, nature can't give a bean an entire thymus gland and lymph lymphatic system to protect it until it can germinate. So what it does is it embeds these, these embryonic tissues with a natural, it's a molecule that is very similar to an antibody. Uh, and many of these lectins are designed to protect uh, seeds and, and things uh, from fungus and other types of uh, parasites until they can germinate. And then as soon as they germinate, the, the lectin is dispensed with. So a lot of, and since we eat mostly embryonic things, when you think about it, we have mostly uh, a diet of uh, various embryonic forms of plants and things. Um, so there was another big association there. We can make a, a kind of a stop, go, yellow light, green light, red light kind of relationship. All that got synthesized in addition to my dad's observations with uh, these physiological things. And then some of the other newer stuff with the, there's actually a considerable amount of stress chemistry related to blood group as well, uh, which may uh, give some fundamental basis to the long Japanese habit of ascribing personality characteristics to blood groups, which I always thought was kind of odd as well. But it turns out that, for instance, um, we know that type O has uh, very low levels of uh, normal subject, low levels of uh, platelet, platelet monoamine oxygenase, uh, which associates with certain types of personality attributes. Uh, type A is associated with uh, uh, very uh, consistent, low level elevated, but consistent elevations in cortisol. Mm. Which is interesting because type O actually has higher elevations, but they go up and go down very fast. Whereas with type A, they actually don't go up very high, but they just don't go down. So uh, does, that mean, does that mean blood type A personalities are, are more likely to be type A personalities as they are generally known? It turns out that actually type A personalities associated with type O blood. 
because a lot, apparently enough, there's a strong link between the function of uh, a chemical called dopamine beta hydrox dopamine beta hydroxylase (DBH) is is associated with uh, the uh, type O expression allele, and uh, this chemical is actually the thing that more or less uh, wicks away your dopamine and converts it into the catecholamines. So it's like taking your happy chemicals and converting them into stress chemicals. And it's interesting because. Um, my father's one of my father, his one of fundamental observations was that type O people just had to exercise a lot, and it turns out that that's really the most effective way of modulating dopamine beta hydroxylase. And so by doing that, you're actually I, I liken it to the if you remember the Godfather, they stored a gun in an old toilet, you know, one of those old toilets that had the the bowl was up above. Yeah. Well, that's your dopamine. And the toilet itself is your catecholamines and dopamine beta hydroxylase is you just yanking the chain so that all your precious dopamine gets converted into something that just gives you type A behavior. So there's a lot of stuff there uh, to unpack. And, you know, the interesting thing is everybody has a, a thought about the practicality of this diet um, in terms of clinical significance or in terms of whether or not it fits their own particular worldview because uh, strangely enough, we have a profession that still in many ways has a preference usually for one unitary diet or another. So you might have some people really strongly paleolithic or, or keto and other people who are more plant-based and vegan. And, and uh, so th this, this theory makes everybody unhappy because uh, they sort of wind up perhaps maybe feeling that they're a subset of a bigger system. But the reality is it's, a, it's, it's an easy system to put to the test because there is just so many easy ways to get that basic information, you know, what your blood type is. And then you can try it. There's places online you can get the information and give it a try. It's a, so, so that was the, well, the Eat Right for Your Type book, which um, um, was, was a surprisingly big success as a, as a, a, a as a print phenomenon, still to this day is in hardcover. It came out in 1995, I think. So uh, still generates uh, lots of enthusiastic people. Um, but I think the interesting thing, what I was trying to allude to before I had my little diversion there, is that you could you can make a kind of a circumstantial case for any of the indicators that I just shared with you the the theory gets stronger if you realize just how each of these very widely diverse things tends to support the central notion in a kind of a very a very consistent way and that um you know here's um a guy naturopathic doctor 50 years ago saying typo should exercise and here's studies that show that you know there's genetic reasons for that um on the other hand, you know, he always used to say type A's really did better with things like yoga and Tai Chi. And if you look at what's the best thing to basically modulate cortisol, it's yoga and Tai Chi. So, um, you know, there's a, I think, a, you know, we underestimate the value of good observational empiricism, although most of the great naturopaths used to observe things and then they thought about it. And, you know, maybe they weren't as hung up about, you know, whether or not, you know, there's a PubMed reference for it they would just keep an eye on things and see if it really, all right, you know, that's odd, you know, let's just, does this thing play out more and what's the situations about it? And of course, you know, you can practice for 50 years, you can accumulate a lot of observational data. Um, and, you know, I've since basically kept up with the blood type research. Uh, most of the things I find interesting now is in association with another gene called uh, the secretor locus, FUT2. Uh, which actually acts like almost a volume control on the expression of your ABO blood type. So uh, you could have, um, uh, you could be a, what's called a secretor, in which case um, uh, they would find your blood type expression all over the place in your body and all your secretions. But about 25% of us are actually, they have a null allele on this gene. And so they cannot secrete their uh, ABO substances. And that might, almost seem like an advantage, except that there's a lot of very odd functional co uh, correlations with this 20% uh, non-secretors uh, that they tend to be overrepresented in things like autoimmune diseases and stuff. Mm -hmm. And recently there's been a lot of, of, of work in this FUT2 polymorphisms with microbiome analysis as well. So I like to put the two together, you know, secretor status and ABO, and that kind of gives me a nice snapshot about an awful lot of insight into what we call uh, glycosylation, 
which is uh, the finishing school for proteins. You know, proteins basically get made uh, easy enough. You know, you link a bunch of amino acids together and then their shape determines how the protein coils and makes its own three-dimensional shape. But then that thing often migrates over to something called your Golgi apparatus or your, they call your endoplasmic reticulum. And then it goes through a finishing school where that protein gets all these sugar molecules slapped onto it. And these sugar molecules are what contain extraordinarily high level information that contain not only receptor specificities and binding preferences, but also geolocation of the molecule, whether it goes to your thymus. If we put a fucus on it, we knock the fucus off, it goes to your liver. So it's like a postage stamp as well. So glycosylation is a very heavy influence uh, on protein expression, disease mortality, and it's driven a lot by ABO uh, genetics. I mean, it's the single biggest predictor of glycosylation and aberrant glycosylation. Mm. And, uh, you can go to things like what, what, what aberrant glycosylation drives virtually every tumor marker that we're aware of. Um, it's associated with uh, most uh, infectious diseases. And that, that actually kind of takes us to the COVID thing because it turns out that there's a long history of infectious diseases linked to blood group differences. Uh, the most uh, striking one was in the 1980s. They had an outbreak of cholera in Peru with a very high degree of lethality. Uh, and they finally concluded that actually the reason for the lethality was because the population of Peru was like 80% blood type O. And this particular blood type actually is prone to having uh, more severe consequences of the vibrio cholera infection. I think it has to do more with uh, um, the, the ability of the cholera to reproduce rapidly. Uh, we know that certain, as a matter of fact, you can look at the, many of the main diseases that are shaped um, the growth or the, the collapse of civilizations. They have ABL specificities, malaria, smallpox, plague. Um, so it's not surprising that people would think, oh, you know, what other viral things out there could have preferences for one blood type or another. Um, and, you know, again, I, I, I wasn't terribly surprised. I mean, the coronaviruses, uh, earlier coronaviruses had shown some blood type specificity in, in there uh, well as well. See, SARS-CoV-1 had some, some blood type specificity. So I wasn't surprised to see some studies. Uh, and then ultimately, you know, it's, it's an, it's, an, it's, it's Blood, blood count, counting things and then looking to see if there's blood type associations is, is not a very effective way of being able to arrive at conclusions, but that's how we, a lot of these people do it. Although if you go back to the early guys who did work in this area, like Guy Frazier Roberts in the 50s, he made a strong case that you have to be extremely careful about how you segregate and stratify the data because very few things are just going to hold up to a simple head count. Oh my God, there's look at all these A's here. Oh, there's no, you know, it's, there's other things. It could be a, a comorbidities. It could be other uh, asp aspects genetically or, or other elements with regard to uh, gender or, or ethnicity. And, 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 and so in those cases, you know, there's a, there's a delicate interplay of multiple factors in, in blood type being one. So then if you sometimes just go and count things, Sometimes you catch stuff, sometimes you don't. So, so one of the things that, I mean, because there is conflicting information just coming out as we speak. And my, my thought is this, in, in what's coming out as far as COVID and blood types, and it first was coming out of China, and they were saying blood type A was having more severe infections. And then they, now Harvard just did in their Harvard newsletter, I think just in the last day or two, came out and said we, there was another study done here and that's not true and then there's another study showing that testing you know it's throwing off tests that maybe people with certain blood types test positive more often than others but it's a false positive so is there is let's let's hit these in order is there any difference in blood type um affecting the testing positives negatives false positives false negatives um and then infection risk like the risk to get the infection and then ultimately if once someone has infection. Is there any difference in blood type and severity of COVID disease that you know about? Well, I think the most recent stuff has actually thrown a, a wrench into uh, earlier associations. For instance, the one that was done in, um, was it Annals of Hematology, the one that mm -hmm. just came out. And uh, they looked at uh, blood group and found that the uh, 
there was no strong association with A, with regard to uh, increased incidence, but they maintained the association that O was associated with lower incidence. So it was a partial validation. It didn't validate the element with regard to A being at greater risk or showing any more likelihood of adverse uh, uh, consequences, but it did uh, strengthen the argument that there was something protective in being type O. Of course, this was turned around to mean that there was no significance, but actually the study didn't say that. Uh, matter of fact, and really made a, point, a, a strong case of, of, of trying to say that it really was fundamentally concurring with the earlier studies that were done in China. Um, the other thing, like I said before, though, is this, it, it was a good study, a large number of people, um, but it had that thing I was alluding to just previously, which is it just got a simple head count and then kind of looked around to see who had what. It did one thing good and one thing not so good. The, it looked at inflammation and it looked at um, uh, positivity and didn't see any great associations. Uh, I would have preferred that they had gone down the ranks of looking at coagulopathies, coagulation problems, because this is where blood type actually exerts its effect. Mm -hmm. In order to do that, I have to take you back to uh, the 1970s. There was a guy, an Australian doctor named Dinton Fass, who did extraordinarily detailed work on blood rheology as predicted by ABO blood type. And he discovered that there were rheology differences. Rheology is the process of how your blood flows, you know, how it can be measured. Uh, that there were significant differences and that if you looked at ABO blood types across the spectrum of a lot of different diseases, including diabetes, cancer, heart disease, and stress, that the viscosity of the type A blood was significantly stronger than any of the others. So already we are looking at a, a, a thing that was missed in the larger study that was done. They looked at inflammation, but they didn't look at coagulation. Now here's an interesting thing. Remember what I said that there's a 30% difference in platelet monoamine oxidase in normal subjects who are type O. There's a 30% increase in factor VIII in type A subjects who are normal. This is the only non-transfusion fact about blood type that your average hematologist does know because this is the kind of thing he has to keep or she has to keep an eye out when they look at the von Willebrand factor and factor eight, they have to keep ABO blood type because if not, they'll actually read elevations that are typically might be associated with pathology but are just normally seen in people who are type, type A. So if we look, and it's going to get a little technical here, because factor VIII is one of the main coagulation factors. This guy in the 70s did all this work on coagulation and found that there was these strong associations with an increase in viscosity under stress, metabolic disease, cardiovascular disease, and malignancy. There's a 30% increase in factor VIII and von Willebrand factor in normal subjects who are type A. So we already got their clotty people. Um, now we take this into the situation with COVID, and what do we know about COVID? Its major coagulation is driven by factor eight and von Willebrand factor, which is precisely the same exact thing we're talking about here. So I'm still not ready to basically not die on this hill because there's strong rationale as to why we should be looking at coagulation, not necessarily inflammation. And with that respect, there's, again, like so many other things, there's more to it than even that. There's a study that was done, um, I think in 2005, where they looked at the efficacy of the opposing blood group antibodies against the infection with uh, coronavirus, especially SARS-1. So take a step back. People have blood types that are who they are. And oftentimes they have antibodies against the other blood types, which is who they're not. So for instance, I'm type A, I have antibodies against type B. My wife is type O, she has antibodies against A and B. My best friend is B, he has antibodies against A. So you might ask yourself, why, why, why do we even have these things? 
uh, to screw up transfusions is what they teach you in medical school. <laughs> the blood type is there to basically screw up a transfusion. But the reality is that it ties into why blood type has such a strong significance with infectious disease. This antigen antibody matrix is a beautiful pivot point for being able to assure that certain populations are rendered immune given some pandemic or epidemic. So you don't see that all infectious diseases target exclusively one blood group or another. It's to, they're spread out equally because many of the uh, antigens that are involved in one particular infectious species are glycans that are going to attract antibodies from one blood type but would be not attractive to another. And that's, again, an antigen antibody type of thing. So part of the, probably the reason we have blood types today, why they, why they still maintain some evolutionary significance is that they, they sort of pivot the population or there's always some immunological subtype that may be rendered less susceptible and more susceptible given to something. So this association with COVID is no, no big surprise here. So anyway, they discovered when they did this particular work that it turns out that uh, it was the possession of an antibody with anti-A properties that seemed to have effects of inter interacting with the, uh, the binding element of uh, uh, the coronavirus, in which case here we're looking at the uh, uh, spike protein that interacts in this case with ACE, ACE2 inhibitors. It turns out that the, anything anti-A uh, seems to apparently mess with this thing. And uh, what's the one thing you can't make anti-A. Well, you can't make anti-A if you're blood type A. You can't make an antibody to yourself. So this, again, strengthens the notion that perhaps maybe the added advantage with type O is by its ability to make a substantial amount of anti-A. In other words, you can't, you, if you're blood type O, you can't get blood from somebody who's type A. And you certainly have that protective thing. Now, 15, 20 years ago, we did some work looking at antibodies in terms of their characteristics across the, the spectrum of the blood types. And there were some interesting things. The, the reason that if you get a, a transfusion and a, they give you the wrong blood, you typically get really sick, is that the antibodies that you make against opposing blood groups are very, very powerful antibodies. They're, they're not the weak antibodies that you might carry, for instance, from chickenpox you had 20 years ago. These are called IgM antibodies. And they're known as isohemagglutinins. These blood type antibodies are capable of glomming cells together on their own. They don't need help from anybody. The other antibodies that we make to things like chicken box or strep, those are IgG antibodies. And they're like, they mostly tag the, the invader, but require assistance from the other cells of the immune system. The antibodies that we make against our other blood types, they don't require assistance from anybody. They just kill. So this is a very deep, very, very powerful system. And the antibodies that people who make, like for instance, type O make against type A are IgM antibodies. But type O was unique in our studies because they also made a, all the other antibodies against type A. They made IgG class antibodies, one through four, and significant amounts of one and four. The other blood types only made the IgM class. So O, sort of has a real um, uh, library of possible ways it can mess with things in the environment that look like blood type A. And if the spike protein looks like blood type A, I think you would predict that if anybody's gonna be able to do something nasty to that thing, it's gonna be type O. So if I were to completely oversimplify what you're saying, <laughs> it's almost like a cross reactivity where the antibodies that are already inherent in someone with blood type O, which is, you know, the ability to mount an antibody response to the A antigen, then basically we're talking about cross-reactivity kind of thing. Like where instead of it being the A antigen of that blood type, it is the spike protein on the coronavirus. Precisely, precisely. because it turns out, and perhaps I should have led with this, uh, the thing that makes me an A is not a particularly special thing. It's a sugar molecule called N-acetylgalactosamine. It's found all over the place. For instance, uh, uh, you know, if you take a supplement called chondroitin sulfate, you're actually taking polymerized N-acetylgalactosamine. Uh, interesting that the joint formula chondroitin sulfate is full of A stuff, whereas 
the joint stuff in glucosamine is full of things that block lectins that react with type O. So there's specificity even in sometimes these arthritis uh, formulas, which are in themselves sugars, you know, which actually block lectins amongst other things. So the, the reality to, without this further diversion on my part here, um, you know, what I would think is that uh, we, we have to look at, yes, as you alluded to, there's probably two separate questions that have to be answered. Is there a factor here with regard to uh, infectivity? Uh, and is there a factor with regard to outcome? Uh, infectivity, the, the, the Chinese studies said yes. Um, the, the study in uh, Annals of Hematology said no. Uh, they didn't say no completely. They said that, they, that, that essentially A and B had the same level of infectivity. So they didn't see an excess in type A. Um, however, I would have been much more interested if they had done things like look at uh, gender, uh, see if men had differences, uh, to look at smokers, because there's some evidence that some of these things change with uh, uh, occupational toxin exposure and things like that. Uh, but nonetheless, uh, we have a clear picture that O seems to be somewhat protective. A, on the other hand, you know, I would still go with the notion that perhaps maybe not go so far as to say that it's going to increase your risk of getting it. I would say it would, we're still on firm ground that there's a possible risk that it could increase your risk of having the coagulation and, and, and circulatory issues. And there's some possibilities there that even might would, would gender dietary advice that might be useful. Mm -hmm. um, there's a, so how do we, how do you wind up making an anti-A antibody if you're not type A? You can't. But remember what I said early on, lectins are like primitive antibodies. And the um, lectins that have very good utility for type A are what are called manos monocot binding lectins. They're, they're lectins that come from monocots that bind manos. Uh, to translate into human speak, this is uh, garlic, leeks, uh, onions. These are your monocots in your diet. So it turns out that actually these foods contain these mannose binding monocot lectins. And guess what? Just like they found that there was an interaction between the spike protein and the anti-A antibody, they found there was an interaction between the spike protein and this class of lectins as well. So if you're basically type A and you want to do some things, first of all, not only would that class of foods give you a possible dietary lectin that might suffice as a mild protective lectin, these foods are in and of themselves anticoagulants. So they have the other added advantage of addressing the viscosity issue. And I mean, I tell, I tell my patients, it's like um, a, a lot of little things you can do. I mean, we have a large herbal armamentarium of anticoagulants. You have, you know, red clover and all sorts of other things that naturopaths can use. Um, but the simplest thing, and this goes back to one of my mentors, the actual man, John Bastier, who once told us that he felt that the juice of six lemons was the rough equivalent to a conventional dose of an anticoagulant. <laughs> so if you are, for instance, type A, Perhaps maybe just a couple of lemons, you know, squeezed might be a very effective anticoagulant as well. There are some other things too. And in order to get to those, I have to introduce another player in this scenario. It's a chemical called E-selectin. E-selectin and von Willebrand factor work together to induce the inflammatory changes in the artery wall that will result in things like coagulation or arterial inflammation, stuff like that. E-selectin has been shown to be, levels of E-selectin in normal subjects are also increased in people who are type A. Perhaps it's not surprising that of any epidemiological study that's ever looked at cardiovascular disease and ABL blood type, they've uniformly found an excess of type A. From everything to peripheral artery disease, myocardial infarction, ischemic heart disease, it always, from the mid 50s, have shown this consistent association with type A. And of course, in the, in the, in the quote unquote blood type diet, what's the plant-based 
rabid food diet, type A, which is the perfect diet to heal endothelial damage and minimize viscosity, right? Uh, because these people don't have the intestinal phosphatases to break down the animal products. So go, go more towards that diet. The, the, um, the other thing with regard to, um, you know, type A and uh, some of the other elements was that E-selectin uh, interacts with the factor A with regard to endothelial inflammation and coagulation, but uh, it makes a strong case for the mineral selenium if you're type A, for instance, uh, because selenium plays into that whole mechanism. Uh, and there's a, uh, another herb that some naturopaths use more than others called magnolia. And uh, it has a constituent in there called magnolol, which actually has the effect of blocking that association that causes the coagulation by deselecting and interacting with uh, factor eight. I know it's kind of complicated, but magnolol is something you can you can buy uh, sub, uh, the, the herb magnolia in, in, in stores. Um, so you know these are things that have some some benefit. Typo. Um, generally, I would say the important things there are really just you know maintaining optimum immunity. Generally, don't be afraid of protein. That's for sure. Uh, perhaps maybe think about watching a lot of the more inflammatory grains and stuff. Uh, typically. Uh, with type A, for instance, I know uh, soy gets a bad rap nowadays, um, which is odd, you know. But then again, you, you, if you love soy, you sort of hate coconut oil. And if you love coconut oil, you kind of hate soy. Um, so, but I, I like soy in type A because if you look at the molecular biology, soy has the most interesting lectin. And uh, as does uh, uh, conventional mushrooms, you know, the silver dollar mushrooms. Mm -hmm. These are uh, N-acetylgalactosamine, blood type A specific lectins. But uh, it's a little complicated here, but you can imagine that um, there's, there, you're, the certain sugars have like um, uh, little, little uh, uh, sort of wings on the sugar, like, like they look like a feather. You know, the feather has a central point and then it has the things that come off on the mm -hmm. side. Mm -hmm. Well, those are in three-dimensional space. So, so imagine if you had a feather where some of the things went north and some of the other things went south. And another molecule, the same exact thing, except where the ones were north in the first molecule, they're now south, and the ones were south are now north. They're the same exact molecule, but they're different uh, orientations in space. Well, it turns out lectins are so specific, they can interact with the subtypes of the same molecule, leaving one alone and interacting with the other. So what happens is they, certain things like the lectins in soy and domestic mushrooms interact with the A molecules that look like A but are not A, leaving the real A alone. And you'd be surprised how many things in nature are trying to take advantage of us by looking like the fake version of us. Everything from ovarian cancer to colon cancer to breast cancer show all of those same tendencies. You look at any cancer, the expression profile always has, uh, well, it's called a beta 1-3 Galnac linkage. It's just a particular type of sugar. Um, and so essentially, uh, and also, too, genistein, for instance, has very positive effects in blunting endothelial damage. It's, it's been a, it's extraordinarily well researched for that. Um, so, if you're type A and you can use uh, soy, it doesn't bother you otherwise, you know, throw a little tofu in the salad and, you know, do those kind of things. Because, uh, you know, there's, there's a lot of baloney with regard to soy, with regard to some of the claims that are made about its injurious effects. I mean, in some points, it's probably not great, some people, but uh, in other people, it seems to work just dandy. And even the bad stuff they talk about, they talk about, you know, studies that were done on rats, but uh, the interaction, rats don't have the same sugar molecules as humans, so the lectins don't work the same way. Sure, sure. Well, and it's interesting that, you know, we're talking about lectins and blood type diet and all this. There's also a very popular diet that removes or tries to remove lectins in a general sense, um, lignins and lectins in general. So, that's the paradox guy? Yeah. Yeah. But let's leave it at this. That will be our next, yeah. our next talk should include that as well as more talk about the um, and oncology stuff, because I agree, that's fascinating stuff. We're going to limit it today. We're going to keep it to COVID. And I appreciate the primer as well on, you know, blood type and how this 
affects health and why it's so different and why, you know, a big part of our medicine is treating each individual. Um, so anyone putting a blanket diet and everyone who walks through their door is probably missing a lot um, of, of better medicine. So observation, I agree, is absolutely the key. So I, I hope that we continue each of us practicing in such a way that we at least are honest with ourselves about what we're observing and trying not to lay our biases, whatever they are, or our opinions on, on what we're gonna see, keep it up in mind. All right, on that note, I wanna thank you for your time and your expertise. And I do wanna put it to be continued because I certainly wanna talk about the topics of oncology and lectins in general, good, bad, or indifferent. Oh, will do. I, I enjoyed our chat and uh, Thank you for, for giving me the time to um, give you some thoughts on this association with COVID and, uh, and blood type. And, and uh, I, think, I think what's gonna happen is we're gonna see some finally some acceptance, some, some a, a priori acceptance of this work in the profession. I just think a lot of it just, maybe the worst thing that ever happened to this theory was that it became a bestseller. <laughs> But that automatically put the physician in a very odd place with regard to how do they respond to it. They would feel almost like there was a gun to their heads at that point. So when I wrote, I used to write a lot of technical papers that nobody understood. Everybody loved the theory. Uh, then I wrote a bestseller and all of a sudden it was like, eh. <laughs> <laughs> there goes all your validity. All right. <laughs> all right. Until next time, I thank you again and we'll talk. Okay. Thank you so much. Bye-bye.